everyone and welcome to the Unlocking Archaeology series. Our channel aims to highlight the amazing variety of skills and interdisciplinary avenues of research related to heritage studies, archaeology, and paleontology in Southern Africa. My name is Mpumi Maringa and I'm the chair of the Southern African Archaeology Student Council and I'm joined by my fellow council members. We have Tatenda who is the SADC representative, we have Sebastian who is the secretary, and we have Nithya, who is our social media manager. Our special guest for this episode will be doing a talk on, the, on uh, his master's research. And our host is going to be Tatenda, and he's going to be facilitating the question and answers and introducing our guest. And before I do the handover, <clears throat> I'd like to say, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Um, also remember to click the notification bell so you can receive a notification when we upload new content. And we welcome your questions, thoughts, and points of discussion. And if you would like to reach out to us to the Student Council or become a member of the Student Society, please feel free to contact us via email or any of our social media platforms. You can find all of that in the description box below. So over to our host, Tatenda, who is going to introduce our guest. Uh, you know, it's it's quite interesting and exciting that I'm, I'm 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 in a position to introduce this guest to you because you know we have been together for quite a long period of time. So before you went to UCT for his masters, you studied with Grace Malbury University, where he was focusing on uh, metallurgy uh, at Grace Zimbabwe. So it's interesting that he managed to continue with his uh, niche of, you know, the, the need to understand metals, uh, particularly Iron Age metals. So currently he's a PhD candidate with the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town, and he's affiliated with the Southern um, African Iron Age Research Group. So his research interest applies geochemical and archaeometallurgical techniques in the characterization and provenance analysis of cuprous metallurgy from a pre-colonial Iron Age agro-pastoral societies across Southern Africa. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please don't be too much intimidated by these big words that he's going to be using, uh, because I understand that he's going to make sure that he simplifies those big words and to make sure that at least you have a better understanding of uh, metallurgy from an ancient perspective. So with um, that being said, allow me to hand over to our special guest, Mr. Bidan Mugabe, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Tatenda, for the invitation. Um, Pumi and everyone for uh, for inviting me to uh, to come and present um, my work on uh, on this platform. I'm um, I'm very grateful. So my uh, like what Tatenda has said, I have been uh, fascinated by uh, by metals. Uh, within the archaeological record uh, and uh, my research today or my presentation today is uh, part of uh, my master's research that try to understand uh, use and circulation of uh, copper in Iron Age Southern Africa uh, is my title states. So this uh, research was uh, mainly confined uh, at um, Great Zimbabwe World Heritage Site. So Today I'm going to just present uh, a section of uh, my master's research. So next page uh, so that we can start. Thank you so much. Um, so what we have here are pictures that shows an overview of uh, what Great Zimbabwe uh, looks like. So Great Zimbabwe is one of the most famous uh, archaeological sites or complex societies that existed in uh, pre-colonial uh, uh, Southern Africa from the turn of the second millennium AD. So what we have to the top left, uh, the picture to the top left, if you guys can see my case, is um, the picture of uh, the U complex and right below it with uh, the sunshine is uh, the Great Enclosure, the most famous one. And uh, to the right, we have um, 
um, the value structures with the U complex um, um, in the background. So the materials that I that I looked at um, uh, uh, when during my masters are coming from a section of the U complex called uh, the South um, Southern Terrace area. Oh, next page. Yes, so my interest in uh, in metals or in cuprous metallurgy cascaded from the fact that within uh, Iron Age uh, period uh, from the turn of uh, the second millennium AD, that's um, 1000 uh, CE up to uh, 1700 CE, uh, metals are omnipresent uh, within the archaeological record, especially at Great Zimbabwe. And uh, previous research that, uh, uh, that was done at Great Zimbabwe has showed that the site has yielded an array of metals uh, ranging from uh, non-ferrous to ferrous uh, metals. That's um, iron, copper, tin, brass, bronze, and so forth. And those that have done research uh, before me um, have managed to to, to to reveal that Great Zimbabwe is characterized with um, a lot of cuprous metallurgy. Um, cuprous metallurgy is just um, metals that are that have an element of copper within them. So it might be copper itself and its alloys like um, bronze and brass. So research um, at Great Zimbabwe, especially when it comes to copper, this is just um, an overview. Is just uh, an overview. So much of the research that has been done has been mainly typological uh, research, which try to classify and provenance copper to various sources. So based on the typology and uh, classification that was done on uh, copper croissants and uh, gongs from uh, Great Zimbabwe, people started to think that uh, copper was coming from uh, the copper belt. This is based on the work by uh, Bison, Swan, and so forth. And then zinc, which was mixed with uh, copper, due to, uh, according to Miller 2002, there is no evidence of pre-colonial uh, exploitation of zinc prior to 1650 or 1700 AD. So evidence of zinc that was found uh, at Great Zimbabwe is shown by uh, research that has been done by Chirikure, Bandama, and so forth, or even uh, uh, Tonjana. They believe that zinc was not locally sourced, so it came from um, from the coastal region. Meanwhile, when it comes to tin, much of the research that has been done, especially by uh, by Grant uh, and Molofowski, uh, who used um, uh, who looked at the rare earth uh, elements and the chemical signature, like using the isochrome uh, dating technique, they uh, they believed or they sourced. Uh, tin to be coming from uh, an area within northern South Africa called um, Roybeck. So this on its own um, is one, this background in terms of uh, the research of uh, metals at Great Zimbabwe started to, uh, it, in, it ignited um, the need for me to try and understand where copper was coming from. So is it possible that uh, the people at Great Zimbabwe were just sourcing tin from, um, from from Roybeck or they were sourcing copper from the copper bells. What about within the vicinity of Great Zimbabwe? But we need to put into consideration that all oh, this research, uh, while least, um, I was writing or going through this research, one thing that I had in mind is what we have nowadays, the modern borders of Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mozambique, Botswana, they did not exist during that time. To an extent that researchers, researchers that, is, that had looked at Great Zimbabwe, they believe that it extended to modern day South Africa, modern day uh, Zambia, Botswana, and so forth. Next slide, please. So in this quest, uh, my research, I just managed to look at 26 uh, wound uh, uh, wound uh, copras uh, wires that are presented uh, in the picture. So most of them were wound or cold on a on a fiber core, and some of them didn't have a fiber core. So this on its own, or during this stage, uh, it was prior. This is the material that came from uh, the archaeological uh, context of uh, within the Southern Terrace area. So I we didn't have an idea of what. 
um, these metals were made of. So in order to try and understand what these metals were made of, we then took these metals and um, used different protocols. And like what Tatenda was saying, we I'm going to try and uh, simplify this, um, some of these concepts. Uh, next slide, please. So what I have uh, talked about before is uh, the omnipresence of metals or the omnipresence of uh, copper within the archaeological record. Why is it? Why is it that copper was omnipresent? Why is why is it that at Great Zimbabwe there is evidence of uh, a lot of uh, those uh, copras um, or copper related wire bangles or those wound wires that I have shown you before? It is because Copper was used uh, for decorative purposes. It might be bangles, anklets, and necklaces, which simply means um, um, bling that we talk of nowadays, or swag, or adornment that we think that is associated with Western ideology. It was there during um, the pre-colonial period, during the Iron Age. It was used for currency and exchange. And exchange. Uh, it might be during uh, bride uh, price payment, taxes, and so forth. Uh, this uh, this brings into mind the book by Herbert, 1983, called um, "The Copper is the Red Gold of um, of um, of Africa, of Sub-Saharan Africa." It was also used uh, for social distinction. It might be class, age, and gender. And within ethnopharmacology or traditional medicinal law, that's some were believed to wear copper. Uh, because it has amuletic or healing powers to chase away evil spirits and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. And um, what we have here are pictures of um, of uh, that were that were documented by Joyce in 1908 uh, from the book called. Um, a woman of all nations. So the picture to the left is coming from um, the Shona or the Karanga women within a region called uh, Njanja, and it shows evidence of brass and copper being worn as bangles, anglets, and necklaces. And to the right also is the same. It's a picture of the Shona that were documented within the north, uh, the modern day northeastern section of Zimbabwe. And we can see evidence of uh, scarring or lacer lacerations and so forth. So probably uh, tattoos did not develop um, uh, after colonization of southern Africa. Probably they were there and this is evidence of that. Uh, next slide, please. So within, um, after realizing the omnipresence and uh, the importance of copper within uh, Southern Africa and previous research that was done at Great Zimbabwe, my uh, research aims uh, uh, during uh, my master's was to try and understand the mechanics of copper and copper alloy circulation uh, across hinterland, uh, Southern Africa. Where was this copper coming from? to understand the fabrication techniques. We are seeing these amulets, we are seeing these bangles, we are seeing these, um, these uh, necklaces. How were they formulated? Next slide, please. So in order to, to try and answer uh, some of these questions, um, the research protocols or the methodology uh, that I used is um, macroscopic examination, like, uh, which is uh, general stuff. After collecting your samples, you do macroscopic examination, you choose, you classify the ones that you want to collect. And within this uh, research, I managed to collect uh, 26 uh, uh, copras or copper based um, uh, uh, um, wound wires and then optical microscope. Uh, same edge was also used. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, qualitatively and semi-quantitatively uh, quantify or qualify or understand uh, the microstructure or the elements that made up these, co uh, these copras uh, or copper-based wires for us to be able to say, okay, this was copper, this was, uh, there is evidence of copper, there is epit evidence of tin, bronze, there is evidence of brass at Great Zimbabwe. So this was uh, the process uh, that it went through. I also used um, the uh, MCICPMS uh, for uh, lead isotopic analysis or characterization of uh, these symbols. 
So most of the protocols that I use, especially for the scanning electron microscope um, uh, ads um, or EDS, uh, was based on um, on Scott 1991. So I also created um, next slide. So the pictures that we see, this is evidence of uh, the processes uh, that we uh, or the application of uh, the previous uh, protocols or the methods that I mentioned uh, earlier. So to the top left, uh, you can see that there is evidence of cut um, Cupra Squire that is placed on an SEM uh, tab. So this was during uh, qualitative analysis. It was prior to uh, isotopic uh, characterization uh, of, uh, of the symbols. So what we did was to just have uh, a general understanding of the composition of, uh, of this copper. But this was just a qualitative approach. This was done to have a general understanding, but the qualitative data is um is something that we uh, we we overlook due to the fact of uh, due to the fact that most of um the samples were were affected by corrosion and so forth thereby we managed to create uh polished blocks so polished blocks are very important when it comes to understanding the microstructure or the composition of um of of uh copper or of um metallic samples so the process that you see there, those um, white uh, blue or those white elements that you're seeing um, on top with um, with name tags inside, that's the curing process. So this was done overnight for 36 hours in order to solidify the symbols and create the polished blocks that you see uh, to the left, bottom left, the small picture with two uh, white polished blocks with the metal immersed in it. So this process of grinding, polishing, it enabled us to understand um, the composition, the characterization uh, of these symbols because uh, using uh, the scanning electron um, uh, microscope, we man uh, same ads and EDS, we managed to analyze the core of these, uh, of these symbols. Next slide, please. So based uh, on the analysis that we had, uh, what we managed to denote is that uh, of the 26 symbols, there is bronze objects were very pervasive. They they were uh, out of the 26, 24 symbols, out of the 26, sorry, 21 symbols were mainly low tin bronzes, right? So this actually uh, adds to the data that we have from Miller 2002, Bandama uh, et al. 2013, uh, that shows that um, great uh, metallurgists or the ancient people that dwelled or that lived at Great Zimbabwe, they were able to manufacture bronze, brass, um, they were able to mix copper and tin to formulate a bronze, copper and zinc to formulate brass. And there is also evidence that backs this up since there is evidence of um, crucibles that were using or that were used for melting these um, non-ferrous metals and so forth. And the fabrication techniques uh, are similar across uh, the site. And as as that as uh, what was revealed by Miller 2002, we see that most of uh, the samples went through the process of hammering, coiling, um, and wire drawing, which is a unique technique that is associated by um, South, that is uh, asso that is unique to Southern Africa. So wire drawing is also evident at uh, at Great Zimbabwe, and this was evident because of the annealing twins and uh, the strain lines that were exhibited within uh, the microscopic pictures, the photomicrograph and the BSE backscattered electron uh, uh, images. Uh, next slide that has shown. Um, below next slide please thank you so what we see here is just uh, a table to give you an overview of uh, uh, the characterization or the composition uh, of most of the metals i was talking of um, evidence of low tin bronzes or bronze evidence of unalloyed copper so what we see here is um, are the results from uh, SE, SEM, 
where we see evidence of, let's say for for artifact number one, which is from War 55 test pit one, level one. It is um, it is characterized by evidence of ion, which is Fe 1.96, um, and copper is um, 92.1, and then uh, Z10, which is uh, zinc, uh, BD1 simply means below detection limit of the instrument, and arsenic was zero. Um, SN was 5.9, which is uh, evidence of, uh, which is uh, tin. So, and lead, there, is, uh, there was no evidence of, of lead. So this on its own, based on its composition, we can see that it had Fe, which was inherent, or ion, sorry, which was inherent within, um, within the copper, but it had also an additional amount of SN. 5.96 which simply means they added more uh, a little bit of tin to create um uh, these low tin bronzes so from this we can actually see that the people who dwelt uh, who lived at great zimbabwe during this period uh the people who lived at great zimbabwe during this period managed to they were conscious when it comes to the materials or to to the symbol to the to the metals that they were mixing they knew that uh, we could mix this certain uh, amount of tin with copper to create a low tin bronze and for people who are interested uh, for for someone who was interested in uh, archaeometallurgy in in these uh, various cuprous metals i can say Unfortunately, or fortunately, in other words, I didn't, um, within the 26 symbols, we didn't manage to find any evidence of um, of brass. However, we have evidence of an alloy, uh, copper, and lotin bronzes. Next slide, please. Yes. So, this... What we see here is just an uh, an example of uh, the BSEE uh, BSE images or the photomicrographs that we have. So this is uh, just to show you from those polished blocks. If you examine them under OM and then you zoom in, uh, if you examine them under SEM, you zoom in, you zoom in uh, to the core of the symbols. This is what the core of the metals were looking like. So the white is. Um, so on each and every uh, photomicrograph, we managed to take uh, probably more than three spectrums. So we're zooming within um, uh, more than three areas at the core of the symbol. So this is just a single sample. This is just uh, two different samples to show you how uh, diverse they were. So the whitish area, one of the most interesting thing is the whitish area, the white smeared um, globals that we see let's say on image one to the top left where there is spectrum one and spectrum two it was characterized by concentrated uh lead while at least um the other whitish areas had uh and elements of um of copper and so forth so we started to think about uh phase segregation uh the development of dendritic arms like what we can see on them on the image right at the mid below, right on the middle, and compositional gradient. So compositional gradient might have been caused by corrosion. As we see to, um, if you look at the image to um, the bottom left with the blackish area and um, and the grayish area. So the blackish area shows that the, uh, the, the image was uh, being attacked by corrosion. That's why we overlooked uh, qualitative uh, data and managed to, to look at the uncolonized or areas that were free from corrosion, like what we see on, uh, on, on the images above with the grayish and the whitish section. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is just a continuation of um, of the BSE images. So one of the most striking or one of the most interesting thing about these um, these uh, copper based or uh, of these uh, low tin bronzes and copper, what we re uh, after analyzing them, we can see that this the t the image uh, on top is one of the images that was taken from 
a copper wire that was wound or coiled on a fiber core. So this blackish area that we are seeing, we are seeing the development of oxides, which simply mean that uh, there was corrosion at the core, at some of those samples, which might have been um, initiated or which might have cascaded from the reaction that was happening between the fiber core and uh, the metallic element. This uh, has been observed by Tyler Court 1989 and uh, so many guys. And uh, the, the bottom um, image is just shows evidence of, uh, of cracking. So this is a zoomed um, image of uh, the blackish area and it showed cracking, which might have been uh, due to mechanical working when they were coiling, coiling or when they were coiling uh, the coke power wires, and this might have resulted from that. Next slide, please. So after going through all this and after having an understanding of um, the composition of our um, of of the samples, what we what I then did is to take the samples. We took the samples for MICPMS for lead isotopic uh, uh, characterization. So most of the samples, these samples that were analyzed for lead isotopic uh, lead uh, lead isotopes, they were cleaned uh, copper and low tin bronzes. So this was used to assess the effectiveness of uh, so this process also was to assess the effectiveness of fingerprinting of trying to denote the provenance of uh, these um, metals to certain metallophorias or deposits so the other process that we did or oh, one of them uh, one of the one of the processes that took a long time or that took my time during this process was to develop a database for for meta for ancient uh for to develop a database that had every of of mines that were mined during ancient times because one thing is one thing that um that i realized through uh reading um most ancient uh uh, books that were published or most uh, revisiting the library from the 1970s, the early 1900s and so forth, is I realized that most of the modern mines that we have in contemporary Southern Africa, they were, they were placed or they were developed or they were, they were placed on top or within regions that had evidence of ancient mining. And one of the most important database that we have, the contemporary database that we have, uh, that I managed to add more data to, and uh, hopefully we are going to present this, and it will be an open access, it will be uh, accessible to everyone. But one of the database that we have was developed by um, Dr. Jay Stevens, um, which is published by, uh, which is published in in an article that was published by Kilik. Uh, 2020, 2020 uh, constraints, uh, geological constraints in um, late isotopic characterization and so forth. So that's the database that uh, that was the foundation of this research. But I managed to add more data and uh, I um, develop model edges to that. I'll explain. Um, I'll explain uh, later on. But when it comes to trying to understand this, like late isotopic ratios from Great Zimbabwe. Um, that we managed to, to develop uh, lead isotopic characterization results that we had from the MIC PMS. And um, what we wanted to do was to have an idea of where these uh, metals were coming from. So in order to do that, what we did is to try and analyze and interpret uh, the results that we have and plot them against the contemporary database that we have in order to have an understanding to say, okay, are the results that we are getting, are they fitting within um, evidence of the ancient mines that we have? So in order to do this, we uh, I used um, convectional biplots, that's 207 uh, lead, um, 204 lead versus uh, 206 to 204 lead and 208, uh, 204 versus uh, 206. Um, this is based on uh, from radiogenic to non-radiogenic versus or uranium and thorium versus uh, thorium uh, lead isotopes. This is based from uh, Baron 2014. And I also used what is called the Mukapati system or the MATLAB script, which is based um, 
which was developed um, after Stacey and Kramer 1975 uh, two-stage uh, model and Albaret um, 2012. So what I managed to realize or what the results that were coming in from uh, the lead uh, isotopic characterization, it was that Great Zimbabwe was characterized by radiogenic and highly radiogenic lead isotopic ratios. So when we are saying radiogenic or highly radiogenic uh, lead isotopic ratios, they will be characterized by greater than 19.5 uh, ratios on uh, it, on most of um, the the urogenic uh, plots, while this, the thorogenic values um, were characterized by less variables. That's 35 to uh, 35 point um, two four to 39.22. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a table that shows um, those characterized symbols that we had with evidence of FECE that we're saying, OK, that we managed to denote that these are um, lotin, bronzes and copper. Now they have evidence of um, uh, the lead isotopic ratios. So like what we have seen before, the lotin bronze, like 455 um, symbol one, which was a lotin bronze, we have evidence of uh, the various um, character, the lead isotopic ratios that we have, and we can see that variation to see to say, okay, uh, under the thorogenic, um, the thorogenic uh, isotopic ratio two zero eight two zero four, it is thirty nine point four eight, uh, a ratio of thirty nine point four eight, and so forth. Our next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, so what we did is to try and match uh, Red Zimbabwe lead isotopic ratios versus uh, the various Southern African uh, deposits. So the initial stage of um, of uh, the initial stage in terms of understanding uh, the pattern was to was to simply assess uh, the relationship of uh, the available data set. That's to check the consistency and the pattern of uh, copper uh, and um, and and lotin bronzes uh, ratios uh, versus the characterized uh, metallophoric uh, deposits or the various uh, ancient mine uh, lead isotopic ratios that we have. So the plots that we have uh, showed that they do match and deviate. Like next slide, please, where we have uh, the plots. So these are the general pro plots. And uh, for people who are versatile with core plot and uh, isoplot ARA and uh, or even the MATLAB script uh, itself, they will tell you that this is a bad plot. But however, uh, this was done using um, core plot. This is just to show the relationship that we have. So the reddish um, plots that we see, the reddish um, circles that we see, they those are the 26 symbols and they were plotted against um, against most um against uh the 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 ratios that were coming from the various ancient mines that we have so if you look to your right you can see that there is a key places like kadoma blue eye so most of the ancient mines within zimbabwe south africa um uh zambia copper belt and so forth they were plotted so as you can see that there is a lot of overlap and we can't understand like the ratio to ratio relationship. We can't understand how it looked like. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This is just a 208, 204 uh, uh, lead versus 206. It's the same. It's just to try and understand the relationship of this. And you can see that it's similar to the one that is uh, presented above. So in order to try and um, overcome this problem of scatter of of, um, of clustering and overlapping that we see we managed to can you go to the next slide next slide so in order to 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 try and address the issue of tight clustering and uh, minuscule resolution that identify uh, that identified the isotopic uh, relations as shown above we managed to group uh, the database or the database was classified into group and assigned um, uh, codes for easy plotting presentation and interpretation so what we managed to do is to group this from group one to group skisting and in terms of this grouping of this class classification it was based on uh, the tectonic uh, deposit um, the district deposit and uh, the area so let's say um, 
mines that were coming from Maswingo Greenstone Belt. It's one Greenstone Belt. So we have various mines that were coming from that region. They'll be classified as a singular, as a single group. And also this was based on the number of uh, characterized uh, deposits that were available. Next slide, please. So this is just um, a table that shows how um, uh, the groups were developed and how they were classified. And in some instances, like for instance, um, for instance, from group one to group five, uh, from group one, which was associated with code one to code five. So the areas within uh, this group were mainly Kadoma, Kwekwe, Bulawayo, Filabusi, and Gwanda deposits. These are within the same tectonic deposit. Uh, these were characterized by 35 isotopic uh, ratios and this ranged from uh, from group to group because uh, when you look at uh, probably let's say um, group uh, six it has a lot of areas like um, the Vau Reef where gold mine and so forth so this was to just have a general understanding and to create um, uh, to create a reduced um, or groups of reduced isotopic ratios so that we can have an understanding of the isotope to isotope relationship. Um, next slide, please. So after doing that, we replotted, um, or I replotted um, the samples uh, based on the groups and uh, reduced ratios. And this reviewed that most of um, the copper uh, and low tin bronzes are merged with all samples uh, or all sample data from groups two and group 10. And group two uh, was characterized by the Copper Queen within the Magonti region, Empress Mine, uh, Midlands, uh, Malfiti, um, Midlands Greenstone Belt, and Mazoe. While this group 10 was the Damarian origin, which is characterized by Dikulishu, Luembe, Matipile, and uh, Kingokula. Uh, next slide. So this is just a single, uh, this is another 20, this is another plot, a 208 PB versus 204 PB that shows evidence of uh, that tight clustering. So it's also reinforced the evidence that was shown on the previous slides to say, okay, uh, our Great Zimbabwe uh, symbols were matching or had, a, had consist, or were consistent, let me say consistent, with uh, areas within group two and uh, group 10. Next slide. So after having an idea of saying, OK, these are associated with um, areas within group two and group 10. But remember, group two and group 10 are characterized by uh, different or um, an array of um, ancient mines. So in order to assess the matches that were revealed within um, the conventional biplots uh, that we saw, this is where um, the Mukapa T or the MATLAB script uh, came into play. So the MATLAB um, uh, or the Mukapa T um, system was um, was once used by Albarred 2012, Pollard et al. 2018, and Stevens uh, et al. Uh, 2018. Due to its uh, it's an extension of the Stacey and Kramer two stage model of evolution. Uh, so the Stacey and Kramer model of evolution uh, it puts into consideration uh, all formation and accounts for geologic um, history of the parent rock deposit uh, than PB isoplot used above. So in other words, what it does is it put into consideration that decay. So for us to have um, simple geology, for us to have uh, 206 lead, it would be because of um, the gradual decay of uh, 20, uh, 238 uranium. And for us to have 207, uh, the parent rock, these all the lead isotopic ratios or the lead isotopic ratios that we have 206, 207 and 208 are radiogenic, which is which is they are a result of decay, while this 204 is the only constant. So 206 and 208 are dotam ratios that decayed from 238 um, to 238 uranium, while this 207 PB is as a result of uh, the decay of 235 uh, uranium, which are found um, uh, uranium, which is which is found within uh, when when 
when the deposits are formed, which is found within uh, the its natural state when uh, the deposits are formed, and then it decays to that. While this 208 is as a result of um, 232 um, uh, thorium decay. That's why later on we'll be talking of uh, thorogenic and uh, urogenic. So when I talk of thorogenic, um, plots, I'll be simply saying these are plots that are a result of thorium uh, decay, while these urogenic are a result of uranium decay. So, so this uh, technique or the MATLAB scripts, it put into consideration that system. So it back calculates. So the separation of uranium and PB by calculating the starting ratio of 2038 uranium into 204, which forms what is called mu. And then the concentration and variation of thorium based on the evolution of 232 and 238, I have said this, which forms what is called a kappa. And then it calculates them to form a model edges. So these will be the model edges of the deposits uh, that were formed, then we'll try and link uh, the symbols into, uh, or, or we'll try and mesh the symbols with the model. Uh, after developing the model edges, we'll then try and mesh the model edges that we have from the symbol, from the samples, from the model, it, uh, depo uh, model edges that we have from the all ratios that are coming from the deposits. So this is used to discriminate uh, possible all sources and artifacts based on the variation of um, Mu and Kappa. So next slide, please. So these are the ratios that were developed uh, for, for the model edges that we have at, um, at Great Zimbabwe. So what we can, um, so what was reviewed by this technique or what this uh, the technique managed to review or what it managed to aid is the model ages and most of uh, the symbols, let's say like uh, symbol one, which is uh, highly radiogenic, it had negative uh, model ages. So for these mod negative model ages, we simply, or I simply overlook them since uh, up to date geochemist and um, archeologist, geologist and so forth, or even archeometallurgists are still trying to understand how best they can um, they can make sense of these negative model edges. So the edges that we managed to, or that I managed to put into consideration are the ones uh, that we have that are that are not negative. So let's say for example, symbol three, it shows that it has a model edge of 108.3, or one, that's million years ago, and uh, ratios of, um, so it shows that our, our symbols, or most of these symbols, all of them, 26 of them, here we can only see 23, but the rest are right below. So we can see that uh, for the 26 symbols that were coming from Southern Terrace area, they range from 108 million years ago to probably 520 million years ago. So they were coming from models that uh, from from deposits that developed during that time. Next slide, please. Also, uh, it's actually 108, 508, uh, 108, 508 million years ago. So highly radiogenic um, um, isotopes, those with uh, greater than 19.5 um, ratios on the 206, 204 PB, PB ratios, most of them they had negative edges except for symbol uctm uh, l10 and wall 55 t3 which showed that it had as uh, it had an, an uh uct l10 had a model edge of 226 y list um wall 55 t3 which is a symbol that came from that uh, area a 200 uh had a model edge of 293 so it seems like most of these edges they were reasonable given the geological zones that we have within uh, sub-Saharan or Southern Africa, within the Paleozoic uh, geological edge. So these edges are a bit younger as compared to the Precambrian or Archean geological uh, uh, edge, where most of the green belts that we have within Southern Africa are located. Uh, this is based on Stevens' um, 20 Kistin dissertation and Kilik et al's recent paper. So it seems like young mobile edge that formed during the Canezoic period or that underwent 
post cryptonization uh, um, were also sourced for for copper. This observation fits in within um, the broad range that was provided by uh, by Kilik of 3,300 to 4, 000, uh, 400 million years ago. So the probability is uh, there is a probability that a deposit that postdates this uh, range were also sourced or were exploited by the people at Great Zimbabwe. So which shows uh, the variation of uh, how the people that existed in pre-colonial uh, during pre-colonial times. Um, uh, which shows variation in terms of the areas that were exploited for uh, for copper. Next slide, please. So in general, recalculated data, the database also, the recalculated uh, model age that we have shows that um, most of the samples that we got from uh, Great Zimbabwe that were within groups 2, 10, and 11, he had young model ages. While least um, the possible candidates that we have within these regions based on um, their, um, their model ages, um, heads up, I didn't present uh, the, the model age uh, database of the, uh, the model ages of the metalloferrous database because it's, it's huge and it's it's something that we are working on to to present later and to make accessible to everyone so it shows that um most of there is a probability that these people were sourcing a model or were sourcing um their copper from areas like the empress malfic um deposits at dikulishi and kipishu uh so these were the mines that were prioritized while least some were discriminated due to the ratios of mu and copper while least thank you so much because the mean values that we have for great zimbabwe is 11.4 uh, for uranium and um 3.75 for 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 copper next slide thanks a lot so these are the slides that we have for for the mu and kappa. So we will try based on the model edges that we have. We managed to discriminate or other um, other sources across Southern Africa, and we remained with uh, groups two, um, ten, and uh, groups two and ten. So within groups two and ten, based on the model edges that we had uh, after using the mu kappa t and developing model edges, we realized that uh, the within those groups. The most plausible sources or ancient mines that we had were mainly within areas associated with Dikulishi, Embrace, Kipishi. So this is why we developed uh, this plot. So based on this plot, we can actually see that despite these ones, these yellow ones are from Great Zimbabwe that you see that have those that have the negative edges. Most of them, they were concentrated between 500, uh, between um, 250, to 580 Great Zimbabwe samples. They were uh, uh, concentrated between, sorry, 200 to 580. And within this region, this this is the region that is associated with uh, even uh, the ore ratios from Dikilishu, uh, Kipushi, and Embrace. That's the Damarin origin and the Midlands uh, and the Midlands are uh, Greystone Belt. Next slide, please. And this is uh, a, a slide uh, like a um, a plot uh, based on um, on on the ratios of the model age that were developed. So it's model age versus uh, kappa, the ratios of kappa. So what we have here, it simply shows that in terms of uh, kappa is also uh, reinforcing the data that was within uh, the move uh, the move versus model age plot. So this plot simply shows that um, most of the samples in terms of uh, the ratios that we have for kappa fit in within the model ages that we have for Dikilishi, Embrace, and uh, Kipishu. Next slide, please. So based on this, we can simply say most of um, these are preliminary conclusions because there is still a lot to go uh, that we need to understand. But based on the data that we have, we can sim I can I can simply say most of the copper artifacts that we that were retrieved from Great Zimbabwe were manufactured uh, using ore that came from 
see you um, copper nickel mineralization within the Midlands Greenstone Belt. That's the, that's the Empress, which is associated with the Empress Malfic. And uh, copper uh, and gold or copper lead and zinc and gold mineralization associated with the Damarin origin, which is the Kundelungu plateau bordering Zambia and uh, the Democratic Republic uh, of Congo. So modern day Zambia and uh, uh, Republic of Congo. This shows that uh, people that existed or people that uh, people at Great Zimbabwe from the Southern Terrace area, especially based on where this data is coming from, they practiced regional, that's micro, regional and inter-regional circulation because they were sourcing copper from the surrounding uh, greenstone, uh, from the surrounding deposits, um, from surrounding deposits like the Midland uh, Greenstone Belt, and they were going as far as uh, the copper belt. And also when it comes to evidence of zinc that is uh, found within uh, Great Zimbabwe, it shows that they were also participating in inter-regional trade. So this research managed to uh, pinpoint or to show that there is indeed evidence of um, or exploitation or copper sourcing from within uh, the vicinity of Great Zimbabwe, like deposits within uh, the vicinity of Great Zimbabwe. While least, um, and also from as far as the copper belt. So this research in general, it showed that there was circulation of copper within a broader, cons uh, a broader uh, across the broader landscape. And one of um, the shortfalls of this research that I know that uh, is going to be asked by even one of the colleagues is we didn't have evidence of trace element or trace elemental data, which is something that we are working on right now on, on the paper that we are due to publish. And to increase also, there is also need to increase the number of uh, ancient mines and other sources so that we can have a fuller or a greater understanding of how copper uh, circulated. Um, Next slide. So thank you so much. And I would like to acknowledge uh, people from Great Zimbabwe University, Great Zimbabwe National Museums and Monuments, and everyone that is uh, mentioned there, Dr. Jay Stevens, Kilik, uh, Mr. Tatenda Tawinge, who was part of this, and um, the South Southern African Iron Age Research Group. I'm grateful to the input uh, of my supervisors, uh, Professor Shadrick Shirikure, Dr. Petras um, Lee Rooks, and uh, even uh, Dr. Vincent Hare, uh, Dr. Robert, and everyone else. I'm grateful and thank you so much, guys, for, for listening. I, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that, you know, uh, your presentation or research uh, to be, to be, um, to be broad uh, looks at a number of, you know, factors that and previously been uh, ignored, you know, from various uh, researches which have been previously done. For example, the aspect of, you know, uh, the sourcing of different minerals from, you know, different areas. Uh, it's something which I feel that it is, um, addressed or it has not been uh, given enough attention. So I, I feel like there is still a lot which is going to be covered by researches which is going to, which are going to be emanating from uh, from this research and uh, kindly uh, um, you know ask them to okay um question um and your yeah, question is uh mainly on uh the sample size like mm -hmm. how big was was the sample size of scope like how big were the samples um that, that samples... used for your research okay um in terms of uh sample size uh we had uh two uh data sets so the samples that we um we analyzed from great zimbabwe are like uh, the wound uh, uh, copper and lotin bronzes, there were 26. So um, we managed to look at uh, the chemistry, the isotopic and everything on those ones. And in terms of um, uh, the 
all uh, deposits, the metal of areas, all deposits that are uh, uh, all ratios that I was making reference of uh, to. Uh, the database is characterized by a lot, like it can be more than uh, 1000. So that's so in in terms of uh, the sample size from like Great Zimbabwe, it was just 26 samples. But in terms of uh, the metal of areas uh, or data uh, database, it had um, it had more than 1000 or ratios from across uh, Southern Africa. Then in terms of um, uh, the all symbols, uh, the the copper symbols that we had from uh, Great Zimbabwe, we had 26 symbols. But in terms of uh, the metalloferias uh, all database that we have, or that we have for uh, all ancient mines within the database, it has more than uh, a thousand um, all ratios from across um, Southern Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Bidan. Uh, I hope Mpumi you have been answered and maybe in uh, regards to that same question. Is a question, has a similar isotopic study been conducted on other metals or gold objects? Similar isotopic study been conducted on other metals or uh, gold objects? Yes, um, I remember when I gave like an overview of um, research at uh, Great Zimbabwe, like Cooper research, um, Isotopic uh, characterization of metals, especially from Southern Africa, uh, is something um, I can say it was uh, spearheaded by um, uh, by Kilik and uh, Molofoski or Molofoskai uh, from uh, around uh, 2007, 2012. Um, they looked at um, at tin, uh, tin in gods, and then. Uh, currently, um, a colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Stevens, uh, Dr. J. Stevens, from also from the University of Arizona, is looking at uh, copper from regions like um, from Botswana, Bosutswe, and so forth. But in terms of uh, characterization in general, uh, work started way back uh, uh, from uh, like Stanley, based on. Um, um, on Gertrude Capton Thompson's work, we have Grant 1999, but they were they were mainly using the neutron activation analysis, and they were looking at um, um, at rare um, rare earth elements. But it's part of also characterization. So isotopic characterization has been um, uh, or is still ongoing. Uh, when it comes to copper, this and uh, Dr. Stevens uh, is the work that is ongoing, especially within Southern Africa. Um, if the question is limited to Southern Africa and um, when it comes to gold objects, uh, I don't want to lie, in, in Africa I haven't uh, come across uh, the research that is uh, looking at um, uh, isotopic characterization of gold objects, unless if I stand to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bidan. Uh, for that response um and maybe in regards to the whole isotopic uh studies isotopic analysis um what are the methods that can be used you know to pinpoint uh provenance uh of of, of metal metals because i understand that you know isotopic they give um you know you can uh, use isotopic analysis to understand uh, the different isotopic levels within the different, um, you know, metal sources, and you can link them to the different sources which, um, you know, present or with the different uh, sample size that we have. And apart from the isotopic uh, analysis, what are the method methods that can be used? Uh, to pinpoint or to understand source provenance of um, ores that were used in the manufacturing of metals. Okay. Um, just before I answer your question, sorry, I have to, I saw a question in the chat that is a follow-up from the question that Mpumi asked. I think it's from Mpumi, which says, my last question is, was the outcome of um, that previous study on tin ETC? 
did it display uh, did it display or uh, displayed similar similar results to yours? Okay, uh, that's that's an interesting um, person because I feel like one thing that I overlooked when it comes to my presentation because this might be emanating from the fact that I was provenancing copper while at least I had evidence of uh, low tin bronzes right which is a mixture of both tin and copper so in terms of uh let me start off from there so in terms of uh, my research i was provenance in copper because in terms of magnitude stores and gel from 2007 up to 2013 they the research that they did showed that in terms of magnitude when it's a lot in bronze you can only source copper because it comprises uh, of 90 plus percent of uh, in terms of, of of composition and in terms of the results that we have the results um, that was uh, the, the analysis that was done on tin from Great Zimbabwe it showed that people source tin from uh, Roybeck that's why I mentioned Roybeck earlier but on on my I also took a data set or all ratios from uh, the area, the Roybeck area, and my results uh, were were different from what was displayed from um, the tin from the guys who were, who were sourcing tin. Uh, and most of my 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 results uh, showed that it uh, the people who were manufacturing the low tin probably is because of uh, the composition, like that uh, copper was not all the symbols were not coming from uh, the same regions. This might be due uh, to um, to the amount, the composition, uh, because I was sourcing, I was trying to source copper, which uh, uh, constituted uh, the larger uh, or the largest magnitude in terms of uh, uh, the elements within uh, the symbol. So these guys, for them, tin was coming from Roybeck, and they didn't manage to 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 analyze other areas like um, uh, Bikita, Concopia, and stuff, which has evidence of ancient mining based on Samas 1969. If you look at his uh, map that he derived, those areas had uh, evidence of uh, ancient mining, uh, uh, of ancient tin mining. Um, when it comes to uh, the second question uh, or the question that um um uh tatenda asked right uh, in terms of other methods that can be used to try and um and uh source or provenance um symbols from uh within archaeology in general it seems like uh lead isotopes um, or isotopic characterization okay i was using lead isotopes but there is an array of um, stuff that can be used like ND, SR, which is nodenium and strontium. People try and mix the two. And also people can use trace elements, trace elemental composition itself. The use of various trace elements to try and pinpoint or try and mesh them within the trace elements within certain ore ratios. I talked of grand using uh, rare earth uh, elements. It's part of that. So. These are some of uh, the take. Oh, these are some of uh, the methods that can be used. But in terms of uh, the instruments, people use different instruments. I used MCICPMS because the instrument you can just um, um, calibrate it or tune it to look at the elements that you want. Both. So if you want, some others use the ICPMS and um, and and the NAA neutron uh, neutron activation uh, activation analysis stuff like that. So it varies from place to place and with um, uh, available instrumentation. But currently, it seems like uh, the most preferred or the most preferred technique is um, uh, lead isotopes. And then you have to add more layers. Like others are using the isochron. Uh, geochronic uh, technique, which is the development of geochronic uh, edges, which are a way advanced as compared to probably model edges, the ones that, are, that, that I was using, which is a similar technique, but different. So it all depends. Others are using the multivariate analysis of even uh, the various isotopic systems and so forth. So it all depends with um, 
with what you have available, but uh, those are some of uh, the methods and the techniques that I uh, that I have noticed that people are using from all over the world. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Bidan. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, the, the one of one of those questions, which is not related to our uh, provenance of of met metals. Uh, you mm -hmm. have highlighted that um, you, you 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 actually found out that some of the techniques which are used to manufacture these um, um, copper objects was hammering. And my question then is, how are you going? Oh, I I. Are you looking at the future where you can um, use swear analysis, so uh, traceology? Oh, use swear analysis. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's uh, that's one uh, that's one interesting um, uh, area that I am uh, that I, I don't want to lie. I'm not versatile even, but I think it's one interesting area. If uh, something uh, comes up, we might actually look at it because it will shed more light when it comes to uh, the concept of, uh, because now what we are thinking of is to look at um, the ethnopharmacological aspect from a, a scientific uh, perspective, where we are looking at um, what copper emits, because we have noticed that even nowadays within medicinal practices, when people uh, have certain problems, probably with their ankles and stuff, they are given copper to wear. So I think if we marry that uh, ethnopharmacology and uh, uh, use way analysis, it will be quite interesting and it will shed more light when it comes to these concepts. And I'm willing to to engage in such um, in, 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 in such research. I think it will be interesting. It will shed more light when it comes to understanding like um, um, archaeometallurgy in general, like in Southern Africa or metallurgy in general in Southern Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Bidan, uh, for, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you very much for answering, you know, the different questions that have been posted to you, the fellow council members. Um, we we'll, we'll look forward to you again uh, for another session of the archaeology. So we hope that you will accept our invitation once again. <laughs> um, thank you so, so much. That's what we have for you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you so much to to the council and everyone for creating a platform uh, for us as uh, students uh, to share our research and to put ourselves out there. Um, I'm very grateful, and uh, thanks to everyone, and thanks for inviting me. <laughs>